Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Uh, as we get into God's Word, uh, I'm so excited we get to learn from Him and get to learn from what God has to say to us at the end of the service. You'll have a chance to respond to God's uh, call on your life, whatever He's leading you to do. You can use that connection card and drop it off at the Next Steps booth. Uh, but for now, I invite you to open your Bibles and get your sermon notes page out. Matthew chapter 28 is uh, where we're going to be. Uh, while you're turning there, just let you know we're in our final week of looking at our church's strategy. Okay, we've been talking about our mission for a lot during the during the year. Our mission is very simple. It's pointing people to Jesus. Will you say that with me? Pointing people to Jesus. Uh, that's what we're all about. That's where we're headed. That's what I want my life to be about. That's what I hope you want your life to be about. That's what I hope our church is about, is that we are a people who we are pointing people to. To Jesus. Now, our strategy is how we point people to Jesus, how we fulfill that mission. And very simply, it's loving God, loving people, making disciples, okay? We got to have an easy mission in order for me to uh, wrap my head around it. Remember, we got to have an easy strategy in order for me to communicate it. So we're pointing people to Jesus by loving God, loving people, making disciples. Uh, in week one and week two of this series, we talked about loving God with all we have. We looked at a thing called the, uh, the great commandment where uh, Jesus says to love the Lord your God with everything that you have. Uh, and to love people the same way. Well, today we're going to look at the third part of our strategy. We've looked at loving God and loving people. Today we're going to look at the third part, which is making disciples. And it comes from a passage, from an instruction from Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, and that's known as the Great Commission. So the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, these two things give us our marching orders. And the Great Commission is, is among Jesus' final instructions to his disciples. And it serves as sort of a set of standing orders. In other words, uh, if you're not sure what to do, do this. You know, Jesus says, make disciples. If you're not sure what to do, make disciples. If you have doubts about what you ought to be doing, make disciples. When all else fails, make disciples. And uh, so as we put all this together, what we see is that we're to love God, we're to love people, and we're to teach them to love God and love people. We're to love God and we're to love people and we're to, we're to make disciples. That's the heart of making disciples is helping other people get to the place in their own lives where they're loving God with all they got. Help them get to the place in their lives where they're loving people like they love themselves and they're teaching others to do the same. They're making disciples. So we're going to look at that passage from Matthew 28 known as the Great Commission. And today we're not only going to see what Jesus tells us to do, but we're going to see uh, how we're supposed to do it. Um, how we can fulfill his standing orders to be people who are reproducing ourselves, who are reproducing Jesus in us, who are making disciples, who make disciples. So Matthew 28, we're going to start in verse 18, read down to verse 20, says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, so there's a few things out of this passage I want us to unpack and a few things I want us to see. The first thing is this, if you're taking notes, point number one is that making disciples is Christ's primary command. Making disciples is Jesus' primary command to his followers and to us. In this passage we just read, the Great Commission, it kind of looks like Jesus gives, his, gives us four or five uh, things to do, four or five commands, four or five instructions. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptize, you know, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach, teach people what he said to do and to be obedient to it, and be sure you know, be assured that he's with you. So it looks like there's four or five commands in there. It looks like he's telling his disciples. And by the way, if you're a Jesus follower, you're a disciple, right? Okay. If you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, that's synonymous with being a disciple. What he's telling these guys right here, uh, and it may have not just been the 12, it may have been a whole bunch of people there, a whole bunch of disciples. What he's telling them applies to us today. God's word back then is the same as God's word today. What he's saying to them, uh, some of it's description, but sometimes it's, sometimes it's also prescription. This is prescription, okay? This is what we should be doing. Got it? Got it? Good. All right. So uh, it looks like what Jesus is, is giving us is four or five instructions or commands, but there's really, there's really just one command, and that command is make 
disciples. Making disciples, there in your outline, making disciples is the main thing. Making disciples is the main thing. Everything else is the how-to, okay? Uh, Making disciples, that phrase, make disciples, is what's called an imperative command, meaning above all else. I am not a Greek scholar, but I get to read and be be blessed by commentators who have studied this passage uh, very well, and they break it down, and they, they look at this, and they say, that there's, there's one command that stands out above all else. It's known as or labeled as a, an imperative command, and that command is make disciples. The other three or four commands are what's called adverbial commands, and they are, you know, an adverb is what modifies the verb. In other words, they are the how-to commands, uh, how you're going to do the main thing of making disciples. Let me see if I can explain to you this way. Imagine that you're on a track team, and I'm your track coach. Okay, we're probably not going to win a lot of races, but just imagine you're on a track team and I'm your track coach and I give you the instruction to run in this race. And then after telling you I want you to run in this race, I tell you I want you to run fast, run hard, run until the race is over, run with all you've got. Now I've given you a bunch of commands, but there's one command that stands out and what is that? Run in this race. You see, if you, if you don't get on the track and run in that race, but instead you run around the football field or soccer field or whatever's inside the track, and you run fast back and forth and all over the place, you know, and you run hard, you know, just running around in circles and zigging back, zigging, zagging back and forth and everything, and you run with all you got and you run until you can't run anymore, that's great, but all you've done is gotten tired. You didn't run in the race. Guys, Jesus gives us a clear command that we as his followers are to run in the race of making disciples. It doesn't matter if we're running around doing a bunch of other stuff. If we're not running in the race, if we're not fulfilling the imperative command of making disciples, we might just be getting tired and not really accomplishing what Jesus told us to do. Now, here's the cool thing. Not only does he tell us what to do, he tells us how to do it. Point number two is this. Jesus gives us the method of for making disciples. Jesus gives us the method. You know, the main command is, is make disciples, and then Jesus gives us the how-to. He tells us the methods we need to use in order to accomplish this main thing of making disciples. Listen again. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, so here's four things that Jesus gives us as the how-to for the main thing. The main thing is what? No. Make what? All right, let's back up a little bit. The main thing is make disciples. The four ways we're going to do it are, and I know you're in your outline, you go, well, the next thing is go, so I have to say go. These are the how-tos, okay? So the first how-to is to go. The first thing Jesus tells us to do is go. Go reach the lost with the good news. Go to lost people and bring them into the family. Go be fishers of men, as Lori shared in, in, the, in the kid's story there, you know? Go bring people into the family so they can become saved people. Can we just be honest for just a minute? Let me just be honest. The very first thing, the very first how-to thing that Jesus tells us to do is probably the last thing that most of us want to do. The very first thing Jesus says is go, and we're like, no, you know? We want to stay. We want to come. We want to stay. We want to sit. We're really happy if people show up. But, oh, Lord, please don't tell me to go. Please don't send me out there to go talk to somebody about Jesus right? I mean, that, that's just how we feel about it, you know? And, and Al Mohler even said, president of one of our seminaries, said there is no happier Christian than one who has found a way not to have to go tell somebody about Jesus. I'll, I'll go work in kid zone, just don't make me go. You know, I'll be a greeter, just don't make me go. I'll sing up here, don't make me go. I'll work in the back, just don't make me go. Listen, if that's you, I got good news for you. Um, we have all sorts of go opportunities. I want you to go. God wants you to go. Jesus commands us to go. But we have all sorts of go opportunities for you that, that some of them you can do without even leaving our parking lot. Matter of fact, we've got one coming up at the end of October. We have Trunk or Treat coming up October 26. When? October 26. We did this last year. 
uh, had about uh, two dozen cars, you know, 15, 20, two dozen cars out there, uh, all sorts of fun. It was a great event. Tons of people from the neighborhood came. They really appreciated that we had a fun, safe event for kids. Our kids loved it and, and benefited from it. And one of the things we said is, hey, we want to do this again next year. Well, guess, well, guess what? Next year's coming. All right, it's, it's coming up soon. We've got a sign-up sheet in the back. We need about 15 cars at the minimum. If we just have six cars, it's, it's not going to be trunk or treat. It's going to be junk or treat. It's not going to be fun. You know, everybody's going to show up and go, wow, okay. So we, we need at least 15 cars. 20 would be better. More than that would be even better. Uh, we're going to have a bounce house, snow cone, popcorn, all sorts of things. So there's a sign-up sheet in the back where you can sign up to help. And uh, if we get enough people, we can do this, okay? Don't wait to the last minute. We need to know now. When do we need to know? And this is a go event that you can do just by showing up at your church and you can help reach people for the kingdom, all right? Uh, the second thing Jesus tells us to do is to baptize, specifically baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them into faith and belief in the triune Godhead. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward decision. It's symbolic of a person's faith in Christ, through, uh, faith in God through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and that's, that's being lived out through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you say, well, why does baptism matter? Why do we have to do baptism? Isn't it optional? Well, no, we're a Baptist church, so you have to get baptized, right? I mean, otherwise, we'd just be 22nd street church, uh, you know. But, but seriously, one reason that the baptism is, 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 is essential is because Christ commanded it. He says right here, go into all the nations, you know, go make disciples. And the first thing he says is to what? Baptize them. He, he commands us to do that. And what you see over and over in the New Testament is whenever somebody placed their faith in Jesus, the very first thing they did was get baptized, it's one of the first acts of obedience that we see out of so many believers. In Acts 2, uh, verse 38, when people asked Peter what, what they needed to do to be saved, he said, repent and be what? Baptized. And 3,000 people were baptized at one time. Well, man, don't you wish, don't, aren't you glad, wouldn't you be glad if you were person number one going through the water and not like person number 2,999 and all right. Uh, and later on in Acts 8, 36, Philip is sharing the gospel with a guy, uh, an Ethiopian on the road back to, he's heading back to Africa. And uh, the guy places his faith in Jesus. And then he, he looks and he says, hey, there's a pond of water. Why shouldn't I be baptized right now? And he does. In Acts 10, uh, 40, uh, 48, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius and shares Jesus with his whole family. And they all place their faith in Jesus. And you know what they did? They got baptized. Acts 16, 33, Paul and Silas share the gospel with the jailer and his family, and they all believe and were baptized. Guys, baptism matters because it's a person making a public declaration of their faith in Jesus. Baptism, it's saying, it's that person stepping across the line saying, I used to believe in this or I used to believe in nothing, but now I believe in this. We've heard from missionaries all over the world, especially in, 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 in regions like South Asia, where uh, it is, they say, you know, it's very easy or it's much easier to lead someone to faith in Christ, but it's much more difficult to see that person get baptized, especially in places where Christianity is the minority and where Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or Sikhism or other religions are the, are the majority. Because when that person gets baptized and makes a public profession of their faith, they're leaving behind their old life. They're saying, I'm now a new person. And they are publicly declaring to all their friends and family that they're a Jesus follower. And when they do that, in a culture where Christianity is a minority, when they do that, it's very different than Western society. When they do that, it's going to cost them. It might cost them their job. It might cost them their marriage. It might cost them their family. It may even cost them their life. But what they're saying is, whatever I may lose that the world offers, I gain in Christ. And I am not ashamed to be called a Christ follower. Baptism matters. And that speaks volumes to others who are watching and other people wind up getting saved because that one person came forward. Same thing's true in here. If you have, if you have placed your faith in Jesus but have not yet been baptized, what are you waiting on? It is such a great opportunity to make a public testimony. And there may be other people around you who maybe they're not worried about losing their job or their marriage or their family or their life, but they're, maybe they're a little bit shy. And they're like, I don't know. I feel weird. You know, I don't want to go up in there and get dunked and then I could get fix my hair and then, you know, 
Somebody, listen, that's a public testimony to say Jesus matters more to me than anything else, more than my shyness, more than my self-consciousness, more than my old family traditions, whatever. So if, you haven't, if you've been saved and haven't been baptized, we want to get you baptized. Our next opportunity is uh, the first Sunday in October, whatever Sunday that is. October 6th? Is that right? We're going to say it's October. Whatever the first Sunday in October is, that's when we're going to do it. And if you want to do it before then, we'll do it before then. All right. Hey, so then Jesus goes on. He says, go, baptize. What's the next thing he tells us to do? The next how-to is teach. The next thing Jesus says to do is teach, specifically teach in two ways. One, teach people the word of God. Teach people what Jesus has taught them. Teach people what God's word says. You know, we, we're doing that right now. We're getting into God's word and we're teaching God's word. We get into a little bit deeper in our connect groups on Sunday morning. If you're not a part of a connect group, get in a connect group. We do it even deeper when we do discipleship and you do it even more when you do your own personal Bible study, your own personal quiet time, your own daily time with God. Get into God's word, spend time in God's word. But don't just, you know, it's not just teaching the commands. He says also teach people to be obedient to the commands. Help them get to the place where they not only know God's word, but they live according to God's word. Where God's word, they're getting into God's word and God's word is getting into them. One of our values is biblical authority and it's because our lives are centered on God's word. And then the fourth how-to, I love this one. He says, be sure. Jesus says, be sure. He tells us to be sure that he's with us always. Be assured that he is always there. I love that he wraps it up with this. You know why? Because making disciples is not all on us. We can feel like it is, can't we? We can feel like the burden's all on us. Being obedient to Jesus' command is on us, but the results are up to him. Isn't that so great? The results are up to him. That means what Jesus is saying is, look, you're not going out there alone. You're not pointing people to Jesus alone. You're not inviting people to church alone. You're not sharing the gospel alone. You're not teaching the truths of God's word alone. You're not leading people through the waters of baptism alone. You're not reaching the nations alone. Jesus says, I'm going with you. Man, I'm just encouraged by that because all I have to do is say yes when he gives me the opportunity. All you have to do is say yes when he gives you the opportunity. And when we do this, when we do this, we can see a real discipleship movement, people placing their faith in Christ and growing, and we get to see number three happen, which is making disciples for generations to come. Listen, I would love it. I would absolutely love it if every single person in here got the joy of leading one person to Christ and discipling that person in their faith. That would be amazing. But you know what? That's pretty short-sighted. Because what really needs to happen is for, is for you to get a chance to lead someone to Christ, to disciple them in such a way that they lead others to Christ and disciple them so that they lead people to Christ and disciple them. Making disciples in such a way that other people want to be disciple makers also. That salvation isn't the end. That baptism isn't the end. That coming and sitting in church isn't the end. That going and baptizing and teaching and being sure that's the goal as we make disciples. It's kind of like the game Follow the Leader. How many of y'all remember that game when you were a little kid? You played Follow the Leader. My teacher had a little song. We're following the leader, the leader, the leader. Following the leader wherever they may go. It, was it just my teacher? Did y'all sing that too? All right, cool. A couple other guys. All right, so yeah. And so what was so great about that game, there was two things going through my mind um, when, whenever I played that game. And one was I just want to keep up. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to get left behind. I don't want to miss, you know, and lead people off in the wrong direction or fall or stumble and get out of line. I want to keep up with the leader and what they're doing, where they're leading. And the other is, when's it going to be my turn? When's the teacher going to say, okay, Ashley, you get to lead. And then I got to be the one who take, takes people over obstacles and around different paths and up the slide and down, up the steps and down the slide and all these kind of things, right? And here's the deal. You didn't want to do it too hard. When you were leading, you didn't want to make things too hard so that other people got lost and, you know, oh, we can't do it. But you also didn't want to make it so easy that they got bored and, and didn't want to play. You had to have that just right kind of leading. Well, in a lot of ways, that's what it's like being a disciple maker. That's what discipleship, you know, when you get to be the person who's leading and you're leading and discipling in such a way that, that you're not making it so hard that the other person just gives up, you know, after the first couple of weeks or months or whatever, but you're also not making it so easy, peasy, lemon squeezy that they just, they're like, well, this is nothing. Why am I even bothering wasting my time on this? You know, in other words, you, you've got somebody then you're investing in them 
and you're pouring into them and you're challenging them to grow spiritually. And all the while, they're, they're not looking at it like it's a burden. All the while, they're looking at it going, man, this is great. This is awesome. I can't wait till I get to be the line leader. I can't wait till I get to make a disciple. I can't wait till I get to help somebody else grow in Christ like I'm growing in Christ. Where's this been all my life? I'm just thankful to be a part of it. And that's the model of discipleship that we're shooting for. That's what Paul uh, says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He says to him, you've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. And so you see four generations of disciple making. You got Paul, okay, who who found Timothy and discipled him. And then he told Timothy, take what you learned from me and pass it on to others who can do what? Pass it on to others. So I want to talk to you about uh, some, some discipleship relationships that we should each have. How can we have this kind of generational discipleship going on in our lives and in our church? How can we be disciples who make disciples who make disciples? Four discipleship relationships that we should have. First, you, somebody that you're learning from. You should have somebody. You should have a Paul in your life. Like you're Timothy, they're Paul, um, or Pauline and Timet, you know, for, for the ladies, but you should have somebody that you are learning from, somebody who is discipling you, somebody who is helping you grow in your faith. And they don't have to be like a super spiritual giant. They can just be a Christian a little bit longer than you and a little bit uh, deeper walk with God than, than what you've experienced, but somebody that you can learn from. Second, someone you are pointing to Jesus. I shouldn't have to spend a lot of time on this because we've been talking about this for months. We started off praying, Lord, help me point blank to Jesus. And then we started sharing stories with these cards. You know, the Lord helped me point this person to Jesus. By the way, keep these cards coming in. We've got them in your connect groups. You want to know these stories. But then, you, you know, you're pointing that person to Jesus, uh, you know, and every single one of us ought to have at least one person that we are pointing to Jesus. But then you get to the next thing, someone you're helping to grow as a disciple. Listen, when that person that you've been pointing to Jesus, when they place their faith in Jesus, you get to do the next best thing you, or the next great thing. You get to help that person grow as a disciple. You get to say, all right, you start coming to church with me. You start coming to my connect group. You know, we got men's prayer breakfast, come to men's prayer breakfast. We got uh, a women's ministry thing, come to the women's ministry thing. You know, whatever it is, you invite them to come along and you just basically say, look, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul said. That might scare some of us, Right? Do what I do. Well, I've seen what you do. I, no, seriously, live the kind of life that someone else says, if I don't know what a Christian looks like, I'm going to follow you, and you look like a Christian ought to look. And so that's what we do. So we're helping someone else grow as a disciple. And then finally, someone you're investing in as a leader. If you're serving somewhere, if you're leading somewhere, that is so great. That is so awesome. But be looking around for that person. Maybe it's the person you led to Christ. Maybe it's the person you, that's growing. Start investing in them as a leader. Maybe it's somebody else who you've been seeing. Say, hey, this person comes to church here, but I don't see him serving anywhere. Would you come serve alongside me? Would you come work in this area with me? Whatever. But invest in them as a leader. Just like Noah did with Danielle. You know, Noah's here today. He's back in the back. We love you, bud. Uh, he's here today, but he's investing in somebody as a leader to help train them up uh, to, to do what she did today. That's what we want to be doing is investing in others as a leader. And as we see this, as we do this, as we uh, invest in others, as we point people to Jesus, as we're getting discipled, as we train others up, we'll see a discipleship movement begin to take place. Hey, listen, as I, as I wrap up and the worship team comes up, let me just tell you, um, I, I think that one of the reasons, I think one of the reasons that churches flatten out one of the reasons that churches hit a, hit a plateau and even start to decline is just what we talked about earlier, about are we doing the main thing? Are we running in the race that God has called us to run in, that Jesus has commanded us to run in? Or are we just running around in the field, you know, doing a bunch of stuff, but it's not amounting to much? You know, we got a bunch of programs, we got a bunch of ministries, we got a bunch of activities, but are we making disciples or are we just wearing ourselves out. And I think churches hit that plateau and even begin to decline when they stop 
making disciples. The same thing is true, I think, in Christians' lives. We see so many people, I think one of the reasons they fizzle out in their faith is they're not running the race that God has commanded them to run. They're not making disciples. And so, you know, they just show up Sunday after Sunday, and they're like, well, I'm sitting in a class, or I'm, I'm helping out in a ministry, I'm doing this, and I don't see it amounting to much. I promise you, if we would get serious about making disciples, if I would get serious, if you would get serious about making disciples, guys, there would be no lack of excitement, no lack of energy, no, no lack of enthusiasm for what God is doing. And here's how I know. Here's how I know. It's because that, that Christians and churches who are making disciples will never get tired of it. Here's how I know. All you have to do is look at moms and dads, grandparents, and even great-grandparents, and how they react when a new baby comes into the family. When that, when that new baby, I have never seen a mom and dad, at least not in this church, go, oh, geez, are you kidding me? I got I to deal with this. I mean, maybe some nights, but, but there is such excitement. There is such joy. I mean, we have things. We have birth announcements. We have gender reveal parties. We have, and then, then, then there's the, you know, hey, here's the first pictures. Here's the sonograms. Here's the first picture of the baby when they, you know, get cleaned up and everything after being born. And, and just, you know, we just can't wait to tell everybody the good news. And, the, and what about grandparents? You guys are posting stuff all over social media. It's the, it's the happiest moment. One of my friends up in Phoenix, he's a pastor, and um, his daughter's at his church, and a friend of his took a picture of him. He's sitting on the front row, and I guess the guy was sitting kind of like where Jeff would be sitting. He's sitting on the front row, and he's holding his little baby. And he's just sitting there looking down at it, like during the worship service or whatever, and a friend snapped a picture and sent it to him. And he's just, just this proud grandpa moment. He's a young guy, but he's a grandpa. But it's a proud grandpa moment. And, and he even posted that. He said, man, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like getting to hold that little grandbaby. And some of y'all know that. Great-grandparents, the same thing. If you've had that privilege of having your grandparents or your great-grandparents even and getting to introduce your child to them, what a joy that is. Maybe even getting those four-generation pictures if you've done those. Oh, man. And so we love it when we bring new lives into our family. I know for a fact, because I've been a part of churches and this church has been a part of it at some times, we love it when we see new people come to Christ. We love it when we see new people grow in Christ. We love it when we see new people come to Christ, grow in Christ, and then lead someone else to Christ and begin to disciple them. But we won't see it if we're not doing the main thing of making disciples. So that's my challenge to you. That's my question to you, is will you say yes to Jesus' command to make disciples? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, all across the room, I pray that you would continue to speak to people today. Would you just ask God right now, God, what are you leading me to do? Where are you calling me to say yes to you? What stood out that God's been speaking to you today? What's your next step? God, would you just reveal that to people right now? Maybe for some of you today, you might say, you know what? I want to start making disciples. We can help you with that. Just fill out a connection card. Just fill out a connection card. Just say, I want to make disciples. We'll follow up with you. Maybe, if you some, maybe some of you here today, as we just continue this spirit of prayer, before you can make disciples, you've got to become a disciple. Before you can point someone to Jesus, you've got to find Jesus. Will you do that today? Will you place your faith in him? Will you say, God, I know that you love me. You can just pray a prayer just like this. God, I know that you love me. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe in Jesus. I commit my life to following him. And I do this by faith in Christ alone. I'm ready to be a disciple. All across the room as God just continues to move on our hearts and speak to us, I pray that you will say yes to whatever God is calling you to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with